you know, the big question, uh, what, what made us, why, why are we here? What's, you know, these big questions, the closest we can get to is, uh, the big, by looking at the big bang, the furthest back we can see ever with all throughout all of time in space is the big bang. And, um, we've been lucky enough to, uh, achieve tons of data on, on our universe with help from Einstein, with help from, uh, Hubble and lots of other astronomers and scientists. So <laughs> what are we evolving into next? Um, I'll take questions later, but right now I just want to go through a quick story of our, a quick story of our existence and where we come from, right? Cause that's, Understanding the past is, uh, helps us understand where we are and where we're going. So, the Big Bang is a model. It's a theory, which is a model in science. In science, a uh, theory is an explanation for things we see. And this is by far one of our best models, the Lambda Big Bang model. And um, essentially... The universe as we know it was in the past way smaller, way hotter. Imagine taking all the stuff in the universe today, all the galaxies, all the stars, everything we know and love, even you and me, even the, the matter that makes up you and me. Imagine taking all that stuff, billions of light years of space and time, and compressing it into a volume the size of a fruit, an apple. Well, that's the Big Bang. That is our, how far back we can see. Back in time, that's when the, that's how the universe was. It was extremely dense, extremely hot, and extremely small, relatively speaking. And since then, the universe has expanded. For some reason, we don't know why. We don't know exactly why, but for some reason, the universe expanded really quickly, really rapidly. I mean, super rapidly such that the configuration of matter and, st and, and radiation was preserved, largely preserved, but inflated like a balloon. So all the space and time we know today was stretched. It's all been stretched out since then. And now we live in the universe we know today. Our galaxies are further apart than they ever were. So essentially that's what the Big Bang means, right? Space is stretching and pulling along with it us and the galaxies and stars and everything um and um so how do we know this well there's a few re there's a few main uh you know large pieces of evidence and the first and biggest evidence is the radiation cosmic microwave background radiation which is microwave radiation that we see all around us 360 degrees every if we take a telescope and we look at the universe every direction there is you look at there are background radiation there's this background microwave radiation in fact some of it is moving through your body right now some of the radiation from the big bang is still moving around you in your room in your house in your neighborhood and now we have built a map of it. And that's what this is here, right? That's a map of all this radiation. So we can see different cold spots, dark spots. But generally speaking, the universe is relatively equal. It's relatively similar, homogenized. In other words, it looks the same almost everywhere you look. And that's what the Big Bang... And that's how we know the Big Bang happened. There's no other thing that could have caused that to happen there's no other event that could have caused that to happen um also we look at the galaxies in the universe uh and we see that some galaxies are red shifted and some are blue shifted so it's like imagine you know Hearing a hearing an ambulance moving around your neighborhood. You know how it get as it comes close to you. You hear the sirens really loud as it comes close to you. 
You hear the sirens go, Wurm. the pitch and tone changes as it moves near you or further away from you. And that's called Doppler shift. In the same sense, this is what happens to light. Light is also moving through space. And as it comes close to you, from your perspective, you see that light compressed. And um, as it goes further from you, it gets elongated, it gets stretched. So it becomes longer, redder. Longer light is typically redder. And, uh, you know, light that seems to be coming close to you is bluer. So why this is relevant is when we look at all the galaxies in the universe, we see that they all, with the exception of a couple that are we know are actually moving towards us, almost every galaxy in the universe is redshifted, which signifies that they're moving away from us from our point of view. So with these two big pieces of evidence combined together, we have a good understanding of what, what may have happened back then. If we, re, if we retrace the universe's history back, right? If you go back in time, play the universe back like a movie, you find that the universe was once closer together. These galaxies are once closer together. Hence, we get the Big Bang model. And there's plenty of other pieces of data that support this, but that's just a general idea of the Big Bang. So, any questions so far? God said that let there be light. Well, light uh, light didn't exist in the form you know and love, always. There may have been a time where there was no light. We don't know. Space is fake. Nope, space is a real thing. You can see it with telescopes. <laughs> nope, it's not fake, guys. Go go learn. If you're asking if you're gonna if you're gonna simply sit there and say it's fake, it's fake, it's fake, well then go do the work and learn if it's fake or not. Anybody can sit there and say it's fake. It's easy to, especially today, where everything is can be photoshopped. It's easy to say, oh, it's all fake. It's all fake. But if you look at the research behind all this, if you look at all the scientists that have done the work, you'll find that it's actually a fantastically understood picture of the universe, right? Um, it is so ignorant to sit there and say it's fake and not understand it. That's the epitome of absurdity. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, guess not. <laughs> um... Let's see what else we got. Now, how people ask, well, how did the earth form? Right, how did the earth form? Well, um, throughout the universe, during the Big Bang, there was a lot of matter in the universe that got distributed. Now, a lot of the matter is stuff we see like gas and dust a lot of it was that but a lot but most of the matter in the universe actually is dark matter stuff we can't see with our eyes we see it in other ways we can see dark matter in other ways by looking at its gravitational effects on things like uh, our telescopes we can see the uh, the light distorted when we look through telescopes. In other words, we see dark matter, we see something gravitationally influencing the area is there, and we see the light being bended as it moves through the dark matter. And we see this with telescopes, right? And that's dark matter. Now, most of the universe consists of this dark matter, and a lot of it is like the glue that holds our galaxy together. In fact, there's dark matter going through your body now. Dark matter is everywhere in a galaxy we just don't interact with it you can't touch it 
If you were to hold a dark matter in your hand, it would just go through your hand. It wouldn't, uh, it would actually go through the earth too. It wouldn't, it wouldn't interact with your body, but it's there. And uh, on a galactic level, it holds it together. It helps the rotation of the galaxy and it keeps it together with, you know, cause if it wasn't there, there wouldn't be enough for it to rotate. Uh, at least uh, as fast as it does on the outer on the outskirts of the galaxy. So, without dark matter, our galaxy would collapse. But thankfully, it's there. Now, the reason why it's important is because a lot of that dark matter clumped together and seeded these galaxies to form in the first place. Without dark matter, there would be galaxies as well. So, um, once you have galaxies, you have heat, you have dust. You have stars. Stars form other stars. There's a recycling of stars. Why? Because stars explode. Stars don't live forever. Stars live and die. And in the early solar system, in the early galaxy, many of the stars were young stars and they were big, right? They were super big because there was a lot of stuff there. And because they were super big, they used a lot of fuel. They were like, you know, the big gas guzzlers of the day. They were those big diesel trucks. They were big and they used a lot of energy, right? So when those big stars, um, they live for a few, only a few million years. They're very short-lived stars. But when they explode, um, they have enough mass, they have enough energy in them to generate all the elements we know today. In other words, the calcium, the iron, the magnesium, all the heavier elements in your body, in the earth, all around us, all the heavier elements were produced in those big stars that filled the early galaxy about 13 billion years ago. And, or, you know, 11 billion years ago. So, once those early stars exploded, all of that stuff all those elements those in, that enriched material gaseous dust clouds they got spewed out into space and from there those gas clouds condensed again because of gravity gravity holds them together again pulls them together again and those clouds collapse those clouds gain gravity as they get bigger and bigger like a snowball going down a, a hill they get bigger and bigger, and what happens? They collapse again under their own weight, just like a star collapses and explodes. Now, when that gas cloud condenses, it collapses, there's enough initial rotation in that gas cloud to form a disk. And these are called, called protoplanetary disks. They look like this. That's what it looks like. So this is when these galaxies are seeded by dark matter and this is what happens after those stars form so we have a planetary disk that forms and it starts to rotate because of angular momentum because because angular momentum always wants to be conserved it starts to spin faster and faster that energy gets gets funneled back into its own disk it starts to spin faster and faster much like when you're doing this and you're rotating and you put you pull your arms in you go faster and faster the same thing happens there the cloud gets condensed and smaller spins faster and all that heat all the heavier stuff gets uh, filtered into the center so you get a very hot center and with enough heat with enough material you get a baby protostar. This is a baby star. And this baby star became our sun eventually, but over time it got bigger and bigger. In its early stages, it releases a shock wave. And most stars do when they're young. They emit these shock waves that push stuff outwards. And a lot of that material, the lighter material, like ice, water, gets spewed out into the outskirts of the solar system. And that's why our solar system has a lot of icy stuff at the ends of it, like Pluto and Enceladus and Saturn. These are very gaseous, very light stuff, light planets, and also uh, very icy planets. 
and moons. Um, and things like ammonia, methane, that's why they're very rich out there. But on the inner skirts of the solar system, you have the heavier elements like silicates and iron, nickel, things like that. And that's why we, our planet, is like heavier than the other, more dense than the other planets. And so we have these small fragments built up in the early protoplanetary disk. These fragments uh, coalesce together. They become larger and larger slowly. And in space, there's something called cold welding. There's what's more dominant when there's no air, no atmosphere, and, and there's no gravity uh, outside of its own source. There is uh, something called cold welding. These electrostatic forces combine metals together way easily, way easier than here on Earth. And in other words, in space, ice uh, metals clump together very quickly, very easily. And that's what formed the mass needed to make larger planets, larger planetesimals, which became our Earth. So that's what the Earth is doing. That's what the Earth is a product of. A lot of rocks clumping together over time. They build like a mountain. And building up, building up, building up, becomes bigger, bigger, big enough, has enough gravity, and becomes spherical. That's another question, right? Why are planets spherical? Why that shape? What's What about that shape? Well, it's because the center of gravity is at the center of the sphere in it. All the it's all pushing down towards that center of gravity, the center of mass. And they all, all sides are pushing downwards, and over time, it's going to become a more spherical structure, if there's enough mass. Um, and we have, with the addition of erosion, original processes, mountains flatten down, they erode, and the surface becomes nice and smooth, relatively speaking. <sighs> And that's why asteroids typically are not spherical, right? Smaller objects with not enough mass, they're going to be lumpy. They're going to be weird-shaped, potato-shaped. Um, but Earth and other larger objects like Mars, Mercury, the Moon, they're spherical. There's enough mass there. Um, now, a lot of that heavier material, like the nickel, the iron, the stuff that our core is made of, because of the density of that stuff, it's way more dense than things like water and sand. Um, all that stuff got pushed down over time due to its higher density towards the bottom, towards the center, the core of the Earth. And remember, this is when the Earth was being formed. I mean, the Earth was almost molten, completely molten back then, right? The Earth was thousands of degrees. So there was no material on the Earth when it was born about 4.6 billion years ago. There was no solid stuff yet, okay? We're talking, the Earth was literally a ball of liquid molten. And um, in that time, a lot of that, a lot of those heavier elements, those heavier materials, liquid iron and liquid nickel, they got, they got, uh, they sank back to the, the core. Over time, they solidified as the Earth cooled down. Uh, lighter material got sent back up. And you have the formation of the different layers of the earth. And that's why there are these distinct layers because of density differences. Um, and uh, you have the core, you have the rotation speeds differ between certain layers because they solidify in different ways. So you have the magnetic field formation, right? That's what the magnetic field is. It's just the interaction between the, the center of the core and the other different layers of the Earth. And this interaction, because they're metallic, generates uh, the magnetic field. And the same applies to all the other planets. Now, <clears throat> so we have, now we have a ball of uh, liquid molten. It's very, let me switch the thing here. So we have a ball of uh, molten. It cools down over time. And what happens? Uh, well, the moon. <laughs> Where did the moon come from? Right? Where does the moon come from? Uh, did God put it there? Did uh, you know, Allah, 
shoot it down from from the heavens no the moon is a another rock <laughs> that is actually the remnants of an impact from the early earth's history about 4.5 billion years ago the earth was impacted while it was molten the earth was impacted by another molten rock the size of mars okay the earth was still as large as it is today but i mean a little bit smaller than today but still a large thing and about four and a half billion years ago, a, a, a Martian-sized uh, planet smacked into Earth and a lot of it dislodged into space. And a lot of that material became the moon over time. That little chunk of molten material became the moon as it orbited around the Earth. A lot of it splashed down to the Earth. The Earth became larger. But that's how the moon got produced an impact. And how we know this is because if we take a look at the mar uh, the moon, the, the lunar composition, right? In other words, if we look at the, we've taken samples from the moon, we've gone to the moon, we've taken samples back to Earth, and we realize it's almost exactly what we find on the Earth. It's almost identical, too similar in terms of composition, that it must be from the same origin. We also find the Earth, uh, the moon was also covered in molten, just like the Earth was. And that's why we think that this is the case. So we have the moon, we have the earth being formed. Now what's next? How do we get to this way? How do we get a blue planet, right? How, how do we get all the water? Where's all the water come from? Uh, well, again, not from magic, but water is common in, in the solar system. Water is an extremely common thing. Water is not rare. It's very common in, in the universe, in, in at least our galaxy. Our region of the galaxy. Uh, water is just a bond between hydrogen and, uh, you know, oxygen. That's it. It's just a three molecule structure of hydrogen and oxygen. It's not magic. And it forms very easily. It happens to be a very reactive uh, combination. And uh, this water is found in the earlier solar system in ice form. It was, it was solid form, ice. Where? Well, there, it was locked in these hydrates. These, these are called chondrites. These are asteroids, mainly made of silicates, but locked in those silicates are little, little crystals, ice crystals. And uh, those ice crystals, when they impact the Earth, remember, remember, we're being bombarded. Remember, the early solar system was a shooting gallery. There was tons of stuff being you know, swirled around the, the, the sun. And um, it was bound to be the case that some things would smash into each other, right? So, but as the, as the solar system became more stabilized over time, uh, we had an influx of asteroids smashing into our planet. This is what we call the early bombardment period. And a lot of those asteroids carried with them water in ice form. And as they come impacted the earth they vaporized on impact by the way they produced the first atmosphere we have an atmosphere now because earth can grab on with gravitationally to that water vapor we also have we also had methane we also had ammonia and we uh, hydrogen gas we had lots of different mixtures of these uh early this early atmosphere being produced by asteroids largely by asteroids so now we have water. Okay. Now it's not liquid yet. Remember, the Earth has to cool down more. That water has to rain down. It has to precipitate. And we actually didn't even have uh, solid ground yet. In fact, the early Earth was uh, not even... There was no uh, tectonic plates yet. They had a form as the crust cooled down, right? remember it was molten, it was too molten in the early stages, but as the, as the crust cooled down, it was able to form these plates that then um, moved across the upper layers of the mantle, which were warm enough to stay liquid, such that we could float upon that. And that's what the continental crusts and the oceanic crusts are. They're just those solid layers of the earth that solidified enough for them to move across the surface and that's why we that's when we have the first land and the first oceans form about three about 4.2 billion years ago 4.3 billion years ago and we have an atmosphere we also have an atmosphere 
Mind you, no oxygen yet. There is no oxygen yet. Remember, oxygen is formed by life. Any questions yet? <laughs> Any questions so far? Where is Noah's Ark? It did not exist. Okay, so where is life? How does life get there? Who caused life to exist? Was it God? Was it magic? Was it a genie? A life-giving genie? No. All the evidence shows that uh, life came about. Oops. Life came about from uh, early chemical evolutions. Evolutions of a series of different chemical molecules that survived to this day in some way. Now, in the early Earth, remember, it was hot. And remember, the Earth still today the core is super duper hot we're, we're talking 10,000 degrees at the center very center of it right it's almost as hot as the, the, the sun's surface that's how hot it is up down there a lot of it is because of radioactive decay a lot of heavy those heavy those larger heavy materials that uranium those radioactive elements they decay and give off energy and that energy is what keeps it hot today 4.5 billion years later, right? Now, a lot of that heat can escape to the surface. How? Through the oceans, hydrothermal vents, or volcanoes, right? That's what essentially what a volcano is. But you have these little areas, these little regions of, of the oceans where you have a particular chemical environment. These hydrothermal vents can spew that water. They spew water, but also in it material from the bottom, from the the, the lower, the, the upper mantle. So you have those a convection zone where you have all that all that chemical, all those chemicals, iron. You have uh, tons of uh, heavier elements, nickel, iron, all these things, all these compounds can form. Iron oxide, for example, too, mixing it with the water. So you have a you have a, a mixture, a chemical mixture that's that's very good for fostering the first amino acids. Amino acids are oxygens, nitrogens, and hydrogens. These are common. These are common in elements in the earth. They're all present everywhere in the on the earth. In fact, they form all the time. <sighs> they formed through gases, through in hydrothermal vents, also in the atmosphere. You have gases that can form amino acids. The building blocks of life are being produced in the oceans and in the atmosphere. And, well, this is the early atmosphere. And uh, you get nitrogen, hydrogen from ammonia, all those, uh, methane from all those gases producing amino acids. These are, these are structures that can perform specific chemical reactions. We more complex to this, but it's simply speaking, you have things called amyloids. These amino acids can chain together. They can form longer chains, and these are called peptides. And these peptides can then form sheets of uh, or longer chains of polypeptides. And then these polypeptides can form even longer sheets of amyloids. And that's what they look like right there. Right? These sheets of amyloids, they can continue growing and growing. They elongate over time as they build more and more. And they actually split off. They get If they get too long, they split. And those to split amyloid sheets can further produce this is called autocatalysis they can they can produce their own reactants they can produce more amino acids to build upon themselves even more so there's a very particular weird chemical evolution happening 
in the oceans, producing these amino acids and these amyloids, which can seemingly produce themselves in a way. So we have some of the first understandings of metabolism, the first understandings of replication. Now, this is not life yet. Remember, this is part, this is a, the, the precursors to life. No DNA either, right? Just very simple chemicals that seemingly do certain things that are interesting. But we, at the same time, we also have things called lipid bilayers. These bilayer, these lipid molecules also produced in the oceans can form sheets as well. But these sheets are particular, particularly uh, spherical in shape. They can, pr they can produce these, fil these uh, films, these filmy sheets that can protect and encapsulate things. So these lipid bilayers can perform spherical structures like cells. And these cells can contain those amyloids and other amino acids and produce the first protocells. And these protocells over time, they also undergo evolution. Now there's, there's tons of different hypotheses to how you go from a protocell, how these this these amyloids and, and basic RNA to things like we have today. But this is how we think it happened. This is a very simple version of it. But simply speaking, you have these this weird chemical evolution happening over time. And this likely happened in different stages and different times, and they recirculated and you have this, you have this, uh, abiogenesis. You have the first living organisms about 4 billion years ago. Life is 4 billion years old. In fact, life happened very quickly, relatively speaking to the earth's formation. So once you have the first cell, once you have the first RNA, which is by the way, just made of amino acids, once you have those first uh, cells that can replicate themselves, well, then you get natural selection. You get evolution, biological evolution, and a tree of life that, that supersedes it, succeeds it. So, four billion years ago, we have single-celled organisms. Right, first, very single celled organisms. Then over time, they became larger, they became more complicated. Then we have multicellular life about 3.67 uh, billion years ago. Then we have worm like animals, worm like animals. Then we have fish like animals about uh, a billion years ago. Then we have um, the first bone structures, the first uh, tails, the first eyes about seven six seven hundred million years ago and we have uh the first amphibians the first amphibians that could live on lands for a bit right then you have the first land animals the first trees a lot of these animals didn't go on land um until about 400 million years ago so there were no trees before 400 million years ago. There were no trees in the way we know. There were no flowers. There were no trees. There was no oxygen until a couple billion, a couple billion years ago. But over time, there was this uh, injection of more and more oxygen produced by those micro cell, the microorganisms, those cyanobacteria produced oxygen which then gave rise to, uh, you know, living organisms being able to live on land. Because remember, fish still breathe oxygen. They just absorb it from the ocean. The dissolved oxygen from the ocean, they absorb it. So they needed that. They needed to breathe oxygen outside of the ocean somehow. And that's why that, bi that bacteria laid the groundwork for them animals to, to live on land in trees. Trees also provided habitats for animals. 
So they were now over time, they were able to live more and more on land. So now these animals become more com complicated. They become things like mammals, reptiles, dinosaurs. The dinosaurs emerged 300 million years ago. They split off from the uh, from the reptiles, early reptiles. And the dinosaurs lived from 300 million years ago to about, you know, 66 million years ago. And there were a s vast series of dinosaurs that lived. And uh, a lot of them are herbivores, by the way. They didn't have to eat meat to be big and strong. Some of the biggest animals ever were vegetarian. <laughs> and uh, remember, back then it was also extremely warm, way warmer than it is today. There was more oxygen in the atmosphere in certain times. And it, the earth itself has gone through various stages of environments and um, at some points, the Earth was colder than it is today. It was uh, like a snowball Earth. There was not enough room for... Uh, there was snow covering the entire planet. But naturally, the Earth changed over time and gave rise to different life forms. Now, 66 million years ago, what happens? A large asteroid in what was one of the latest extinction events, mass extinction events, an asteroid destroyed the dinosaurs. The larger dinosaurs died off. 75% of all life on the planet died. The food chain got disrupted. Animals died. The smaller animals could no longer feed the larger animals. The larger animals died quickly. The vegetation died out. The largest animals died very quickly. The smaller dinosaurs survived the impact. The smaller dinosaurs who can move, who can fly. Birds. Birds are dinosaurs. And they still exist today. We still have dinosaurs roaming our planet. They're called birds. Chickens are dinosaurs. Uh, every bird you see. Ostriches. Um, chickens. Uh, hawks. Eagles. They're all dinosaurs. And they... Or are the remnants of those dinosaurs that existed 66 million years ago. Also, beings that survived were mammals. Small, shrew-like animals that had, you know, little tails. They lived under the trees, they lived underground. But after the impact, after the dinosaurs died, those animals were able to uh, emerge out into nature and evolve. Over time, over millions of generations, they evolved into more complicated beings. They grew, they, over time, they became monkey-like animals, ape-like species. Their tails went away. They walked more upright over time. They walked further and further out of the trees and became human. That's where we come from. Humans come from a branch of apes that existed about six million years ago who began to leave the trees of Africa. That's where we all come from. We all come from Africa. We all come from Central Africa, where our ancestors left the trees and started foraging for food, hunting, foraging. They began to use fire about a couple million years ago. Uh, they migrated outwards into the other continents like Eurasia, uh, Northern Europe, uh, Eastern Asia, um, eventually North America, South America, the first civilizations, the Mayans, the uh, Aztecs, the Mesopotamians, they all emerged about 10, six, 10, six, 10 to 6,000 years ago. You have farming. We, now we don't have to migrate further. Right? Humans can now live closely together without having to move and migrate all the time. Now they hunkered down into cities, into civilizations. They farmed for food. They, drawed, they drew water from wells. They utilized canals for boating and for shipping things to other cities, right? As, as, as we grew, as civilization grew, more and more people 
traded things, economies developed. Then we have paper emerge. We developed paper, one of the greatest inventions. Now we can store that stuff, all our knowledge onto paper. Now we can transmit it to different generations. Then we have the Industrial Revolution with the advent of uh, Newton's gravitational laws motion right he tells us how things move how to predict the movement of things and forces of things this gave rise to steam engines and uh, the um, internal combustion engine giving rise to cars and ships and uh, trains and planes with the Wright brothers right the first uh, flight about 110 years ago then we have the advent of rockets, right? We go to space, we go to the moon, we develop the internet. Now we can globally communicate together very quickly. Now we can, now information passes at light speeds, literally. So look at that transformation. Look at all this, all the changes that have occurred um, since the first life. Look at the story that emerges when you understand the past, when you understand how it all flows together. Um, look at our story. Very, very interesting. Very, very powerful. And uh, it is important to look back in retrospect and understand where we come from. Uh, and how privileged we are to be here today. I mean, look at our past. Look at our ancestors. They had terrible lives. I mean, well, from my perspective, they did. I mean, for I'm sure. But there was a lot less prosperity back then. There's a, uh, Nature is harsh, right? But today we live in a world where we use our knowledge for the better, betterment of all. We use our knowledge and our brains to help each other more than we don't. And that's why we're here. Um, that's why we're here today. Because our ancestors worked together. The ones who worked together survived. And that's why we have all these things that we've carried on through the years. right? Our emotion, our empathy, our kindness, our love and compassion. All those things carried forward because they helped us survive better. As they do today still. Um, so... Um, This is important to learn about, you know. Gives you great insight on our history and what we, who we are, and where we're going. Do other planets have volcanoes? Sure, they do. In fact, Mars has a volcano the size of Arizona. <laughs> I mean, it's dormant now. It's not working anymore. It's dead. It's cold and dead there. But it was a volcano that is the size of Arizona, the biggest in the solar system. The largest volcano is on Mars. Um, there's volcanoes on Io and Venus that has evidence of volcanoes that are no longer active. Uh, let me see if I have a picture. But yeah, here we are today. There's our planet. This is a real photo from space, right? Um, this picture <laughs> makes you feel a certain way, right? Looking at looking down from space, Th and this is the first time we can see. This is the first time in history that we can look down on our planet. Because for so long, humans have always been territorial animals, all right? Always looking for our land. Where is my, this is my land, that's your land. Uh, we're so hateful to one another sometimes, right? We go to a war with each other. We are hateful sometimes. We're bigoted, we're racist, we're homophobic, we're sexist. But from this perspective, there, is no, there are no borders. There are no boundaries to, to our territories. From this perspective, there is no holy land. There is no, um, you know, dividing line between North and South Korea. There's no dividing line between 
Palestine and, and, and Israel. There is no such dividing line here. From this perspective, we're all here on this one planet, sharing it, sharing all of its resources. Look how thin that layer of atmosphere is. In fact, the atmosphere is as thick. You know, take a take a average globe of the Earth, right, in in a, in a classroom or something. The atmosphere is as thick as the paint, the coating of paint on the surface of the the globe. That's how similarly the uh, atmosphere is thick compared to the globe. That's how thin the layer of air you're breathing is. And we all share it, right? So the same air that you breathe is the same air that everybody else breathes. And the same water you drink is the water that everybody else before you drank. We all share the same resources, the same planet. And look how fragile it is, you know? Especially when we look back from this perspective, which is which is uh, another picture of the Earth. But where is it? Oh, there it is. See that little pale blue dot? That's the Earth. From four billion miles away from one of our Voyager spacecraft, which is still flying out in space about 40,000 miles an hour. But this is an, a real photo taken from one of our spacecraft four billion miles away. That's the Earth. That's us. That's home. That's our planet. That's where everybody you know lives. Everybody you've ever heard of. Every classmate, every teacher, every friend, every family member. Every one of your haters. Every one of your lovers. Everybody. Every superstar. Every politician. Every slave. Every mother. Every child. Every war. Everything has occurred there on that dot. The only one we know, we have. That's is it. This is all we got. This is a, that's all we have is that place. We have no other place to go as far as we see. Um, we don't have another home, right? So from this perspective, look how fragile we are. Look how precious it is. This just reiterates the fact that we should take care of this pale blue dot. We should cherish it, you know? Um, and learning our story also tells us about who we are. We're not that different. In fact, we all share common ancestry. <laughs> We're all family. Every one of us are family. And when you understand this, you it all just clicks and goes and you go wait a minute all those wars all that fighting all that hatred it's so petty it's so childish it doesn't make sense anymore to do that stuff from this perspective you know you have a more um, humble perspective of of the world of our universe i mean not just our planet but also the universe i mean the universe is a vast, empty place, as far as we see. 90 billion light years across, and there's no other life form we know of yet. I mean, there could be, but they're light years away from us. We're never going to get there within our lifetimes, right? So think of how vast the space is. Think of how big the universe is. That just makes it even more precious to cherish that dot. So in both ways, um, it tells us who we are. Um, and it tells us to be more careful, to be more kind with each other, to be more loving, to be more patient and kind. Because you can travel a thousand light years and you'll never find another person like you. And, you know, you go back to this picture... Life on Earth, right? Life is especially magical. Life is especially incredible. And we all share a common ancestor. And even more fundamentally, 
all life comes every every atom in your body remember every atom in your body every every element of calcium every atom of calcium in your teeth in your bones every atom of uh, nitrogen in your blood or in your skin or every atom of iron in your blood it's all traceable to stars that exploded billion four five billion years ago remember those stars i was talking about in the early beginning every one of us every living being on this planet can be traced back to that moment where you're made of star stuff you're made of the stuff of stars that have exploded and eventually coalesced into you i mean how magical is that and the and the most magical part of that is it's real it's true we can prove this we can show it that is exciting to know that not only are you in the universe but the universe is in you that you carry with you a part of the history of the universe um that is another interesting perspective that you're that you are the universe you we are it and that just uh, is a deep profound understanding that utterly dwarfs any other perspective i know especially religion <laughs> because what does religion want to tell you that we're the only ones that are important um that uh we have to worship god and he's the only one that uh, we need no I, I think that's a petty perspective this is a more incredible understanding of things uh like how divisive religion can be oh this is the holy land that's or or you're a you're a slave you you should not be treated the way this person should be treated they're an israelite or this person's a hebrew this person's not that's divisive that's a very egocentric way of seeing the world whereas this scientific perspective is something that just changes your way of thinking it changes everything about how you see every atom in the universe it changes how you see not just people but every molecule every drop of water every breath of air <sighs> um and this is all i want to show people you know um there's a lot of polarization today on the internet especially people are very rude and mean and they feel like they can be mean because they're anonymous online and uh, they feel like they can just be hateful the worst of us is brought about by this uh, anonymity that we express when we're online especially when we are uh, trying to push our own agendas or we have a particular perspective that, that, that we think is the only one that could be had uh, that is what go, that's where we go wrong as people we think that uh, only this person can uh, do good only this only this way is the correct way when you have that mindset it can be very polarizing so it's important to look back sometimes from this in this perspective and go wait a minute maybe all that stuff is petty maybe we aren't that much different maybe we can understand each other better maybe there's another way so again a scientific perspective can change can help in this it can aid in this polarization it can reduce it i think it can uh purify the waters of social media and uh yeah any questions 
Hope you guys learned something. Who's who's learning something today? Who has opened their eyes today? Who is like going, wait, this is crazy, Mike. This is great. Is the Earth a perfect sphere? No. The Earth is far from a perfect sphere. Now, the reason why is because uh, its formation had produced different... Uh, it's not going to be perfect, right? It's not going to be a perfect uh, sphere. Ah. Uh. Okay. You learned that dark matter is the glue of our universe. Well, it's not the glue of the universe. It's the glue of our galaxy. Dark matter is just like regular matter. It's just... Uh, it it, it uh, has, a, has a gravitational effect that uh, you can't see with your eyes, but you can see gravitationally. And it holds our galaxy together but there's many other galaxies there's billions of other galaxies out there but intergalactically there is no medium that we there's no matter we know of except for vacuum energy which isn't matter it's just energy uh and we don't really know actually what space is Keep stars near the center and the outside of the galaxy shall be the same speed. Yeah, if you... Yeah, if you... Exactly. If you have... Uh, the, the reason why we know dark matter is there, or there's some kind of dark matter, is because the arms of a galaxy are... If you look at a galaxy's rotational speed, they're very similar in speed on the inside and the outside. So the way the galaxy rotates is indicative of there being extra matter there that we can't see with our eyes. That's why we dark matter has to be inputted into our physical models. But yes, dark matter is integral to keeping our galaxy together. Yeah. You would expect that the center would be faster than the outside, but that's not the way it is. It's very similar in, in rotational speed. By the way, can you guys hear the music or is it like low or? Is it a good volume? Okay. I love this picture though. It's such a beautiful planet. I can look at it for days. <laughs> In fact, that's where we began, right there. That's where humans began. Near modern day Kenya, Ethiopia. Hmm. It's a blue marble. Could the universe have existed before it collapsed in on itself? Well, we don't know the size or shape of the universe. We don't know. All we know is the Big Bang. All we, that's the end of our knowledge of the universe. Beyond that, we have no idea if the universe collapses again. And it, it, it's possible that the universe expands and collapses, expands and collapses over and over again. That's a possibility. In a cyclical way, it, it does this. Um, but there is no good evidence so far suggesting either way. We all come from Africa. Yeah, all of us come from Africa. Uh, it's 
absolutely incredible. And what I've what I've spoke about today is a, just the service level of the science. I mean, there's way more science. I'm just a, I'm not an I'm not an expert. I mean, I have a science degree, but I'm not an expert in this. And uh, but I think that you don't have to be an expert to understand it or teach it. I think that if you have a significant uh, understanding of what it means to be scientifically literate, you can do it. You can learn it, and it makes it all that more exciting. <sighs> okay, matter cannot be created or destroyed, so cyclical universe makes more sense to me. Well, that's only if the universe is uh, closed. Uh, if, the op if the universe is open, if there's an external source to our universe, our local universe, well, then, well, then energy can be inputted and outputted. There could be this, uh, you know, this exchange of energy between us and a larger landscape. Um, so it could be the case that there is, there are other universes, right? There are other, other universes out there, each with their own different laws of physics. I mean, they, there's all kinds of possibilities when you understand string theory. Um, it's possible that there are other universes with different dimensions, different types of dimensions, each giving way to different laws of physics. Why does lightning strike taller objects? Um, well, typically, lightning is caused by a charge in the upper atmosphere or the lower atmosphere and the ground. If the charges, in other words, opposite charges attract, and if there's enough charge, lightning strikes that area. So the path of least resistance is if there's significant amount of amount of charge on the ground or on a tower or something or a tree that lightning is going to want to hit thing that with the least uh, with the smallest path of resistance and uh, that's why taller objects typically get struck first but that's not always the case right sometimes it's the case that uh, depending on how the lightning travels through the atmosphere that it strikes lower places first it all depends on the charge it all depends on the the charge the the uh, the, tr the type of lightning bolt it is the uh, many different factors i'm getting paid by nasa i wish <laughs> how do you know hurricanes never cross the equator oh did i know yeah You're having trouble explaining how the Big Bang wasn't the beginning. Well, when you say beginning, it's arbitrary as to what you mean by beginning. You know, if you ask me when did I begin, well, I can say I began at conception. But you can also say t technically that I began with, uh, you know, the Big Bang. So when you say when did we begin, we don't have the full context of the timeline of the entire universe. All we know is the Big Bang. So it's not that the Big Bang is the beginning. It's the end of our knowledge of the universe, the known universe. So the, the timeline could extend further than the Big Bang. We just don't see it. We can't see it. It's also possible, it is also possible, however, that the universe did begin at the Big Bang in a, in a way that um, time itself emerged at the Big Bang. Uh, event. Um, that's a possibility, but we don't know. So the point is that it could be either way. It could have began, it could have not. We don't know for sure. There's data going both ways. Just not enough in one favor. What are clouds made of? <laughs> how do they taste? Well, clouds, you know how clouds taste, because if you ever have, uh, you know, seen a foggy day before, you know what a cloud smells and tastes like. Because that's what a cloud is. A cloud is just a water vapor uh, that are that's dense with, uh, you know, water droplets and other dust particles that give it a, a thick appearance. But um, fog are clouds. That's all it is. It's just a water vapor that tends to uh, co coalesce in certain ways. Uh, 
Why do meteors dissolve at the atmosphere? Well, when the asteroid... First of all, asteroids are going thousands of miles an hour. Remember, mind you, these asteroids are going 30, 40, 50,000 miles per hour. They're going super fast, right? They're going 10, 20 times the speed of sound. So not only are they going super fast, but now when they uh, enter the Earth's outer atmosphere, now they're being introduced with molecules, particles of air. What does that mean? Friction. Okay. So friction increases as the, as the asteroid gets closer and closer to the Earth. Um, so this friction builds up as it gets closer and closer, and what happens is it heats up. The, uh, the meteor heats up, and a lot of times it explodes right then and there. There's so much heat that explodes, uh, or the, the amount of pressure there is, right? Pressure builds up as an asteroid moves through the atmosphere. It's, if it's large enough, it pushes through the atmosphere and pressure builds up. If there's enough, if there's too much pressure, it cracks the asteroid and it bursts. That's another way that larger asteroids burst in the atmosphere, but the smaller ones dissolve. And they, in fact, that's what a shooting star is. If you see a shooting star in the night sky, sometimes that's what a shooting star is. It's an it's a little meteoroid that has entered the atmosphere and has ignited. Can other animals have their own religion? Well, yes. Animal elephants have. First of all, religion is a specific thing. It's a, it's a specific human ritual that is a bit more comp complicated than an animal ritual. However, animals do perform rituals. Elephants have been shown to bury their young, bury their dead. Uh, elephants understand death and they do perform rituals. Monkeys also understand death. Some, for, some types of monkeys do. They mourn their dead. They hold ceremonies in some way. They hold rituals in some way. Now, mind you, these are very, very primitive versions of rituals, but they are rituals nonetheless, and they're kind of like the precursors to what we do as people. We are a bit more elaborate in our rituals and ceremonies and, and religions, but yes, religion is something that many other animals have the ability to do. Is it possible for a disease that turns us into zombies? Uh, what do you mean by zombie? Right? It all depends on what you mean by zombie. Uh, in, in the sense that <laughs> a disease will allow you to come back to life? Probably not. But in terms of a disease that makes you uh, mentally deranged and, uh, you know, makes you do... Makes you, in a way, brain dead. Yeah, of course, those things are possible. But coming back to life, like the movies, no. If we evolve from apes, how come apes are still around? Well, firstly, it's important to note that we are apes still. We are still apes. It's not that we, you know, it's not just that we come from them, but we share common ancestry with other apes today. So, in other words, imagine them as family members, but they're cousins, right? We sh if you go back far enough in our history, in our genetic history, you find that we share common ancestors. And there, imagine a tree where one branch of the tree branches out, and they become modern gorillas, modern chimpanzees, and, and then another branch branches out and becomes human, right? They become human. That's how it is. All it means is if you go back far enough, you find that we share a common stump. And that stump is a common ape ancestor about uh, six million years ago, of which all modern great apes share ancestors with. So chimps, 
bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, all share, we all share, we're a family that all shares a common ancestor. And if you go further back than that, you'll find that modern monkeys also share a common ancestor with us about 50 million years ago. What is the lowest point of the earth we can go to without dying? Um, I think, well, the Mariana Trench, Mariana Trench, that, well, technically we were on a submarine there, so no, you can't, uh, you can't live there, but I, I believe uh, Death Valley, I think Death Valley, I think is a couple hundred feet below sea level, I don't know. But I know there's mining that some mines can be a mile below sea level. I don't know. It's around the mile mark, I believe. Probably a couple miles until we need to get like uh, masks and stuff. When monkey sees us, do they know we are a part of them? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> I, I don't think they would know. What are my thoughts on cryonics? No, they don't work. If it works, it's way more complicated than we know today to be. Uh, if if if, it, if you can freeze somebody and <laughs> preserve all their bodily functions, uh, it is something that we don't have the technology to do today. Um, it's never been successful, such that we can preserve somebody's life. In pictures of planets, why are they perfect spheres? Well, they look perfectly spherical in pictures because, I mean, they're. It's hard to find the differences when you're far away, right? When you when you zoom out, things look more uh, symmetrical and uh, smoother. But if you were to look at, we have probes that circle the Earth, and we find gravitationally, we find gravitational anomalies in certain areas. We can map them out. We can see that the Earth is kind of a, this oblate spheroid where there's lumpy areas uh, here and there, making it not a perfect sphere. But, I mean, as far, you know, generally speaking, the Earth is very spherical, very smooth, especially because of its, of its erosional surface. Why do you think animals think, what do you think animals think when they see us? Well... <laughs> depends on the animal. I mean, if you're talking about a insect, I don't imagine they could have that <laughs> too many thoughts about us. But if you're talking about a monkey, well, they probably understand quite a bit about us in themselves. Some monkeys are self-aware. Uh, and if we take a look at gorillas, well, gorillas think very, very much like us. In fact, gorillas can actually perform hand signals uh, and understand language, so they well to a degree, and they, they can understand words, they can understand sentences. But uh, I could imagine that gorillas know quite a bit. In fact, I would suggest that they know much more than we think. Now, are they going to perform calculus? No. All right. Are they going to know what rockets are and how rockets work? No. But can they understand, like you know, the sun? What the sun is? Could they understand? Um, you know, water, you know, how to pour water into a cup, how to do basic hand language. Yes, I think those are possible. Will our consciousness be replicated into AI? <laughs> well, consciousness is complicated. Um, see, we are biological organisms. We are, we have biological consciousness, right? We, we have a particular brain type that gives rise to consciousness so to replicate it perfectly it can't be done with any kind of computer okay however you can potentially um <clears throat> digitize consciousness in a way such that you might get experience in some way digitally 
Because after all, consciousness seems to be fundamentally electrochemical. And if you can kind of replicate that digitally, it could be possible, but it's never going to be a, an exact replica. So I don't think we'll ever exactly replicate our experiences ever again. I don't think you, it's, I think it's possible. I don't think there's, you'll never be the way you are again, in my view. So, but will there be aware robots in the future? Yes. Will there be aware and perhaps conscious robots in the future? I would say yes. Do animals have morals? Yes. Elephants, um, many mammals, gorillas, apes, chimps, all have some kind of moral system. When will the first humans land on Mars? Um, well, probably the clo the next closest date would be 2033. And that's the reason why is because Mars and Earth orbit around the sun Sometimes they get close enough in their orbits such that a trip there wouldn't be too bad. It would only be about eight months. But every few years, the orbits get far, far apart enough such that a trip would take years. So there has to be, a, there's a certain time frame. There's a, there's a, there's a, a key time frame that has to be met to go to Mars with current technology. And the closest, ne the next closest time is 2033. That's when we'll be closest to the Mar to Mars again. I mean, but after that, it's like 2036, then 2040, right? Every every few, three or four years, this happens. So, um, and I don't see us going to Mars in the next couple of years. That's not probably going to happen. So I, I would suggest 2033. We send reconnaissance robots that, you know, might take a look at Mars, perhaps build some habitats for us. And then we we'll, humans will come a couple of years later and settle. Okay. Hi, Loudy. How are you? Mike, do you know that pressure decreases in, in an intensifying hurricane? Yes, <laughs> a lot of things decrease over time with hurricanes. When will the first human... Okay, can insects think consciously? Well, I think all animals are conscious to some degree. I think there are degrees of consciousness. Uh, I think you can separate animals into different degrees of consciousness and awareness. I mean, obviously, I'm more aware than a baby, right? I think that adult humans are way more conscious than a baby, and uh, in that same sense, I think that there are different levels and degrees of consciousness in other sets of animals. But yes, I think that even the most simplest of organisms that are multicellular and at least have a neural network are so in some way conscious and aware. Which non-Earth do you think has the best chance of harboring life? Well, <laughs> many. Well, first of all, there's many, many planets, even in our own solar system. In fact, just a couple of days ago, we have discovered an entire ocean of liquid water under Mars. Now, the problem is it's 20 miles deep. The water is very deep underground, and it's probably very, very salty, such that it couldn't be drinkable. But it's possible that there might be life, microbes at least, in these ancient old aquifers on Mars. And um, who knows? It could be possible that life exists now on Mars. But not on the surface. There's too much radiation. It's too dry. It's too cold. But deep underground, there could be life there on Mars. The... However, I think the, the most exciting uh, potential for life is Enceladus. This is a moon of Saturn. It is covered in ice snow. But it also has an ocean deep down under its surface. But this ocean we know has amino acids. We have seen amino acids come up from these uh, plumes that spew from Enceladus. And we've seen 
lots of amino acids. The building blocks of life exist on the moons of Enceladus. And this water is not too salty. It's, in fact, much like water on the Earth. It's actually almost identical to water on the Earth in terms of composition. It has the right amount of salt, potassium. It has, it has uh, uh, amino acids. It also has hydrothermal vents. So there's enough heat energy in those Enceladus oceans to foster life. It has all the right ingredients to, to form life. So that's the most exciting, I think. And the other exciting one is uh, Europa, which has also ice and water. So look, wherever there is water, there could be life. Wherever, wherever liquid water exists, look on the earth, even in Antarctica, if there's liquid water, if there's any water at all, there's life. Even in the deepest of oceans, there's life where there's water. There's life everywhere on the earth if there is water. So we think, as scientists, or people, as scientists think that if you go look in the, in the, in the uh, other planets, other moons, if there's water in liquid form, there's likely life especially if it has all the right ingredients. Okay. Um, <laughs> why is Q top a flat earther? Well, in this case, I'm not exactly sure, but I can tell you generally, people who believe in flat earth also, along with it, believe in a host of other conspiracy theories. And the, pro and the reason is, is because somewhere along the line, they lost sight of the scientific method. They forgot how science works. They forgot how to think critically, how to um, verify things critically. They forgot how to understand the research. They forgot that uh, corroborating data uh, is required f to make scientific claims. They forgot what science is. And somebody had uh, convinced them out of their own ignorance that the earth is flat because what they have done is let their intuitions guide them. Because, look, it's intuitive to think the earth is flat. I don't see curvature. I've never been in space. There has to be a conspiracy because I've never seen the curvature. And it's a bit obscure obscure to, to understand why exactly the earth is spherical i mean it takes mathematics it takes you know scientific understanding of uh of uh certain things especially gravity and those types of people lost sight of the scientific method they stopped being curious and they just let their intuitions guide them and they just go oh whatever feels right is true and that's a sad reality, you know. It's sad that we live in an age where there's so much information, and there's so much to learn, and people squander their potential intelligence by following their feelings. It's sad. What would happen if our sun was replaced by a black hole? Good question. Nothing would happen in terms of our gravitational uh, state of affairs. We, if, 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 the, if a black hole immediately replaced the sun, it had the same mass. Right? You, can, you can have a black hole with the mass of, a, of our sun, but the size of a city, the size of a... Not even the city, probably uh, the size of a house or bigger, or maybe a mountain. You can have a black hole that size, yet be the mass of the sun. So as long as the mass is there, well, the Earth's rotate, the Earth's gravitational, um, the Earth's uh, orbit would remain the same. We would still have 365 uh, days in a year. We would still rotate the same way. However. The black hole probably isn't hot enough. It wouldn't probably hot enough to radiate heat 
like we have today. And it definitely wouldn't be bright enough, right? So <laughs> um, it wouldn't, we'd probably be frozen to death. We'd probably freeze and all life would die. However, we'd still be rotating around the, the center of the solar system just fine. What would a universe with multiple time dimensions look like? It's very difficult to say because different scientists have different opinions. Uh, but some science, some scientists think nothing would change. Some scientists think that you could time travel. It's all over the place. Very difficult to comprehend. Would it give us cancer? Uh, no, it wouldn't give us cancer. Um, the radiation probably would be the same or similar to the sun. But that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I don't s imagine it having more radiation than our sun. But I'm not sure about that. Is death something we should worry about? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to die. So yeah, I do worry about it. But I focus on my life. I don't uh, worry all the time about that. I just do the best I can. The sun is a star. Do other stars have solar systems and planets? Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, most stars in our galaxy have planets orbiting around them. Even our closest star, Alpha Centauri, or Proxima Centauri, has planets around them. In fact, some of Proxima Centauri's planets are Earth-like. They're uh, rocky. They're smaller. They're probably hotter, but they're rocky. And we have we have recently seen thousands of exoplanets. They're called exoplanets. We have thousands of them recorded, and uh, hundreds of them are, are Earth-like. And a, a few of them, a handful of them, are actually in the habitable zone, which means that they're close enough to the star, they have the right temperatures, and they potentially have water. So, yeah, there could be all kinds of Earth-like planets out there. Uh, let alone other planets. I mean, there's a whole host of other possible weird, strange, uh, exotic exoplanets, namely things like hot Jupiters, which are gigantic planets that are super-duper hot, and they're big, but they're bigger than Jupiter, but they're still planets. Other planets, they um, uh, could be made of diamonds. There's some diamond made planets made of diamonds. Uh, planets that are very strange. Will teleportation of humans be possible? Mm, probably not in the way that you think. I mean, Star Trek made it uh, look simple that you press a button and bam, you're, you're in a new place. But the process would probably be complicated. Now we have teleported individual particles or even molecules, but uh, it's not like that one mole, it's not like that same molecule is teleported. It's like, it's uh, has to do with quantum mechanics in which there's a different state of that molecule, but uh, it's very complicated, very complicated. But uh, as far as we know, it's not possible on the human level, but possible on the micro level, in a way. What is string theory? Um, well, people have thought that atoms were the smallest things, right? That atoms were the smallest things possible. But a few experiments in the 1900s found that even smaller, even in the spaces between atoms, there's there's energy, there's pressure. And um, this pressure, there, that means there's something within space itself that is that has a mass-like effect on things. And... 
that's when string theory was so when quantum, quantum mechanics was produced but or kind of uh, elaborated on but string theory is a theory in quantum mechanics that says that if you go beyond the atom if you go beyond even the nuclei beyond the protons beyond the quarks smaller than electrons and the smallest particle whatever it is if you go deep deep down you find that even atoms themselves even quarks themselves are made of these string-like filaments they're one-dimensional or two-dimensional they're not even three-dimensional but they're two they're one-dimensional strings that vibrate in certain ways and those vibrations, depending on how it vibrates, the frequency of those vibrations give rise to specific particles. So a certain vibration might give rise to a gluon. Another vibration might give rise to a quark. Another vibration might give rise to an electron. And if you have a bunch of these strings, much like a chord, like a you know guitar chord, you have a bunch of those strings vibrating together, you have an atom. Uh, even more, a sympathy... A, 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 uh, a symphony of chords of vibrations of these strings generates a, a molecule, right? And, and if, uh, music, these mu this, uh, uh, the, the music composed of these strings is a person or an object. So that's what string theory simply says, says that deeper than atoms are something more fundamental that the universe itself is made of. And every atom is, and it kind of what it does is the reason why it's good is because it, you can get from those vibrations of strings gravitons, which give rise to gravity, right? So you can explain gravity through quantum mechanics. You can meld them together, and bam, you have a theory of everything. And that's what people have been scientists have been trying to aim for for so long, but it's complicated. It's uh, there's a lot of problems with that theory um, that haven't been exactly resolved yet is time travel to the past with the use of wormhole possible yes in a way yes um but it's a very complex you'd you'd have to utilize time dilation you'd have to travel in a rocket ship and have a wormhole connected from a stationary object to a moving object that's moving close to the speed of light and that time difference going through a wormhole you're going to different times essentially but it's mathematically possible but extremely not practical extremely impractical how is air invisible <laughs> well air air is made of uh you know water vapor carbon dioxide oxygen nitrogen well, you have to remember that the density of air is very small. It's very low density. Right? It's not like an, uh, a physical object like this. Um, a water bottle is more dense. There's a lot of molecules per, you know, per, per volume here. And uh, that's why things are, appear solid. You can see them because there's enough matter there to disturb light in ways that are obvious to us. But when you go to liquids, it gets more difficult to see. And then when it gets to gas, it's even harder to see because the density is so low that uh, your eyes can't uh, distinguish molecules from each other. Um, light doesn't interact with it in ways that are sufficient enough for your eye to see, apparently. Or obviously. Uh, but air is there. And you can see it sometimes depending on the conditions, right? If it's a humid air, if it's... Uh, if it's cold outside and you breathe, you can see the the water par particles uh, interact with air. But you know, it's that's because there's a lot of water particles from your body, right? So it's it's hard to, depending on the conditions of the air, what type of air uh, you might be able to see or not see, depending on how light interacts with it. Do you believe in those stories that people have traveled in time with facts? No. I don't think anybody has time traveled. <laughs> At least not human. Do neutrinos inter interact with neutron stars? 
Um, I don't think they interact with anything. I don't know for sure, but... Why does bro have a picture of Saturn? <laughs> if you think this is Saturn, I feel bad for you. <laughs> because of the density of a neuron, even a neutron star, I thought it would. Uh, well, no, that's not how that works. Neutron stars are very dense, but they are, uh, neutrinos are very small and, uh, still I don't think would uh, interact with neutron stars. What causes near-death experiences? Uh, well, there are many ideas, but the most common idea is the sense that the brain has a fart. Your brain farts, it makes a mistake. Uh, your brain is complicated and it goes from states of different states of, states of consciousness and sometimes when your heart stops beating when you're or when you're going through traumatic experience um where your heart's pounding or 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 being very abnormal your brain it, your brain starts to secrete different hormones that effectively distort your consciousness they might give you visions they might make you dream certain things they might give you the hallucination that there's a light that you're moving towards it's everybody has different experiences but essentially there are hallucinations brought about by the brain uh, because of some hormonal change caused by the body <sighs> have you seen the show devs uh, okay i'm getting tired here a couple more questions but hopefully you guys learned something today How about the paranormal? I have witnessed things move by itself. <laughs> well, that doesn't mean it's paranormal necessarily, but it means that there are things we can't explain. And I understand that there are things we can't explain. I agree that that when things move, when there's no when there's no wind, it's I don't, I don't, what happened. What what is there? But it doesn't mean that a ghost moved it. Right? It it could also be the case that there's other things that we haven't taken account. Have you learned about these, JK? <laughs> Such as, uh, well, um, there could be a giraffe. There could be a movement in the object itself internally that causes it to move. Or, you know, perhaps a table, one of the the bottoms of the table maybe breaks and the, the thing moves. Uh, there's many different possibilities as to why things move on their own. But I agree with you that there, at some, there are some things in this world that we can't explain. I agree. But we have to be cautious before we just go, yeah, yeah, it's ghosts. We have to be cautious. We have to recognize that we are fallible. That we could be wrong sometimes. Even our, our most... Uh, even the most intuitive things to us, I mean, the things that seem so intuitive and true might be wrong, you know? And we often have the, the motivation to want to believe that there are ghosts that we live on and that there's a God, but, you know, we have to uh, continue being honest with ourselves. <laughs> That's how we progress, we pro progress forward. Why do we feel itchy? <laughs> uh, well, I think it has to do with your skin cells. Uh, I, I, I think it has to do with blood as well. Blood. I don't know. Actually, I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, but probably something to do with your blood moving through your skin.
Stop taking away people's life purpose. <laughs> no God equals no meaning. That couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, to me, God has no meaning on it. God has no meaning. And to me, life has even more meaning if there's no God. Because if all we have is this one life, if this is all we got, this one planet, this one life, this one experience, that is something to cherish, right? And why it means something to us is because we enjoy it. We love life. We love our family, our friends. That gives me purpose. That gives. I like that. That gives me purpose. I can explore. I can learn. I can challenge myself. I can do amazing things. And we all can do amazing things. That makes me happy. That gives me purpose. And I don't need God for that. Um, and, you know, think of it. If, if God does exist, well, he's just telling us our purpose. I don't want to be told purpose. I want to make purpose. I can generate it by doing things. I can help people. I can love people. I can teach people. I can do incredible things that are on my own. I don't have to wait for God to tell me that I'm doing good. I can do it on my own. And that's why I think life has more purpose without God. We we're not just placed here. We are accidents. We are accidents. I mean, think about this. All this stuff, right? The earth, the planets, life, the universe. I mean, think of all this. What if it is accidental? That's crazy. It's remarkable. If we are here by chance, well... Life makes, uh, to me, life makes more, life is even more incredible and amazing that we are here by chance, you know? It's um, profound. Life is amazing without religion, especially. <laughs> so...